Welcome to the Course One podcast. In this podcast, we explore the emerging open financial system. We dive into scalability, interoperability, proof of stake, blockchains, and many other parts of this coming financial singularity. Tune in every Monday to dive deep into these cutting edge projects and protocols with Course One team members and guests. So, hi and welcome. Uh, we're here today with Lukas Vogelsang. He's the CEO and one of the co-founders of Centrifuge. Centrifuge is one of the networks that we've been running on the testnet and we're very excited about kind of being part of their mainnet launch, which is coming up very shortly. And yeah, today we're going to speak a little bit about what Centrifuge is, what the problem they're trying to solve and some of the technology they're building. So thanks so much for joining us today, Lucas. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, so, you know, I have to say actually many years ago I was... I spent like seven months working in, in trade finance and on the, on the execution part. So basically in dealing with like shipping goods of like petrochemicals and agricultural goods across the world. And this was like such a horrible process, you know, the entire like how to do this thing with like shipping containers and insurance and letters of credit. And when I learned about a blockchain and kind of got into that, it was immediately like, this would be such a great use case to like change that. So when I, it was kind of a similar thing when I learned about Centrifuge, it was like, oh, finally, somebody is kind of doing this in the right way. And yeah, so I'm super excited about what you guys are building. And yeah, I think it's, it's a massive use case, but maybe let, let's start off like, tell us a little bit, what's the history of Centrifuge and how did you end up working on this? I, I guess like you, I, I have a history in trade finance and building building supply chain finance products for many years. Um, actually, the history behind Centrifuge, like it requires a little bit of an explanation of what uh, the founding team did in the past. So we started a company called Taulia in uh, San Francisco around two years ago, uh, 10 years ago, I'm sorry, that is building supply chain finance products for, I think by now they're their customers include over 120 of the global 2000 companies. And so what Talia built is essentially a, an ERP, so enterprise software plugin that plugs into SAP and Oracle. And so these, these uh, accounting software, accounting systems that companies use to manage their supply chain and extract like financial information that can then be used to offer financing to the suppliers that these large corporates have. So we did this. So we we offered early payments on invoices that, for example, a like bottle cap manufacturer or making something up to Coca Cola would actually invoice to Coca Cola. Coca Cola would say, "Okay, this invoice is ex- approved. Our payment terms dictate that we'll pay you in ninety days. So you'll get your money on your bank in three months from now." And then, oftentimes, like these these uh, suppliers need the cash quicker, right? Like you have to pay your your own suppliers ahead of time. You have to pay, pay salaries on a monthly basis or sometimes even more often, right? So like having a large order with a, with an outstanding payment for three months is often not something that these smaller businesses could necessarily sort of finance themselves. And so what, what companies do is that there, there are many different financial products, different uh, service providers that offer to bridge these cash flow gaps. And, and, and so one, one traditional way is just to go to a bank and say, here, I have this customer that is going to pay me in 90 days, but I, I need the money right now. Like what interest rate are you going to offer me? And, and uh, can, I, can I get the money now? Right? And so what we did with Tally actually, we said, well, we're going to work with the buyers to offer essentially a credit on, on these invoices, provide like using both the buyer's um, data direct so getting getting data right from the source and sort of offering this at somewhat advantageous terms to the suppliers so that they could finance their operations so they could pay their salaries and so on and that and so from that experience of building this business Talia finances around 20 billion dollars in in invoices a year right now there are I think around 200 people in San Francisco uh, and and all over the world so so but but building this um, like we, we sort of came out saying, okay, like if we reimagine this to be built with an in an open and decentralized network, like what could be the thing, the things that we could do better and where where could we leverage this technology? And so around and it, two and a half years ago, yeah. Yeah, I mean I was just wanted to ask a quick question on mm-hmm. Talia before we go into mm-hmm. that. So 
how does the supplying capital work in this context? I presume that it wasn't you. So did you guys have like banks or investment funds or like how, how did that side work? Yeah, so at, at Talia, we actually had two mod, two models. We could use the buyer's extra cash. So if Coca-Cola had extra Coca-Cola or the large buyer. So if they had lo- extra cash on their bank accounts, they could pay pay invoices early and sort of make that make that interest themselves. And if not, then we would connect them to a, a hedge fund that was providing this capital at, at very low rates. And so then actually the hedge fund, the buyer, and and the supplier would sort of like each, it was a win win win. Like all, all all these three entities would get sort of get a little cut on the transaction. The supplier getting cheaper rate, the hedge fund being able to borrow money on very safely, and the buyer sort of getting small um, a small share in in this. And yeah, and then so the the case for, I mean, it sounds like it worked pretty well. So why why <laughs> putting it on a blockchain? Why making it a decentralized uh, protocol? It, it worked really well, largely for the big corporates and for the banks financing it. But where we saw, where we see issues still and what sort of what we started looking at is like what we built with Talia is just another data silo. It's just another entity that has a whole lot of financial information that's extremely valuable, but zero interest in actually sharing it or making it available. And so like we were able to like help a huge number of small businesses to get access to capital that they otherwise might not have had, but definitely not to as many as we wanted. So there were plenty of companies that fell through the cracks that didn't sort of fit into one of the baskets of of companies that the buyers or like the banks wanted to finance for some many different reasons. And and really like what what Talia did and and sort of like is inherent to the business model of these, of, of a Talia and like a lot of these enterprise software companies, a lot of these platforms is, well, that they their date they have really no incentive to share their data because that immediately threatens their business model and it sort of goes against the core of what they want, which is just like having control over it. But by sharing this data, you can actually open up these assets to many different investors and you can let these they can let financing happen in places where I think today it can't. And so that's something that we see the DeFi ecosystem in Ethereum already doing to some extent with a lot of these crypto, like crazy crypto fin- financial products that, that exist. And it's something that we sort of want to bring this very broad category of real world assets into, right? So if we can take these assets that, that companies have today and make them liquid in Ethereum on the in DeFi, then that that leads to many more financing use cases being possible. Hopefully it, it will lead to a lower cost of capital for these suppliers. And sort of it will help these companies to unlock the like the liquidity premium that exists on on blockchain, right? And that's that's where I think it it's sort of there's still a huge tremendous opportunity way beyond um, what the traditional financial system can do and what I'm really excited about building the centrifuge. Cool. And so for you, did your interest in blockchain come about that, you know, you were working on Talia and then you kind of saw how blockchain could solve this particular problem or tell us a little bit about like how you became excited about, you know, this space and this technology? I, well, so I've had a few touch points with, with crypto, like from being in Silicon Valley in 2012 when Coinbase was founded to um, like being heavily, being very fascinated by by Silk Road and like playing around with Silk Road, being like sort of always like looking at it, but not more than just a, like intellectual curiosity and like never any doing anything with it. And then so like as as my my co-founders and I also gradually left Talia over the the years between 2015 and 2017, I sort of decided to. Uh, sort of reset my my uh, my career, my life a bit. I was traveling for a year, leaving, Sil- leaving Silicon Valley and traveling for a year and then coming back to the US to start to, to work on something new. And I, and I have a very broad idea of just saying, oh, like maybe I'll try either to go into, to look into what we, what sort of this blockchain stuff is all about. And, and, and I have to say to that, that I was a huge open source fan and a nerd already, like, from a very early on in my life. So sort of like looking back into that 
uh, side, and then like machine learning was another thing. So I had just like very two very broad technical topics. So oh, this could be interesting. And in the end, I, I don't even remember why, but I picked crypto and, and blockchain first, and and sort of really started thinking about it and realizing, okay, like like it's not just Silk Road. It's like not just uh, Ethereum and ICOs, and like there's really a lot of cool stuff that you can build. And and then like got together with with the my ex. Uh, colleagues from Tally and uh, my co-founders and uh, we started thinking about okay like what what could this look like for for centrifuge and we started with this very broad vision and spent plenty of time like sort of coming up with ideas in 2017 decided we wouldn't we don't want to do an ICO just with a piece of paper although that 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 was very a very attractive a very realistic scenario at the time but we said okay let's let's figure out sort of where you want to go and and um, took took a few more years uh, to get to where we are now, where we we have a product that we're quite excited to be pushing out into the world and, and sort of ship actually shipping. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Well, let's let's dive a little bit into sort of how this works technically. So let's say I'm bottled cap manufacturer, right? And I have a bunch of you know uh, invoices outstanding. You know, how would one actually go about using Centrifuge to finance those? Like, what's kind of the user flow like there? Yeah, so 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 with with um, Centrifuge, we're we're building the the necessary infrastructure to go from like off chain, like real world asset that's sort of a contract, an invoice, a purchase order, even a property title, sort of whatever asset you can imagine, and like sort of bringing that into DeFi, and making liquid, and like our our long term vision is that that Lisa's Pizza Joint is always the example I use. Lisa's Pizza Joint is 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 able to get to Lisa is able to get her her invoices financed, her outstanding receivables financed um, through through Centrifuge. I think sort of looking at crypto today and where it is, our our direct our users are what we we call asset originators. So someone that has access to these assets, has a user base of, of many different suppliers that they can offer a financing product for. So, so you can one of the one of the early pilots that we worked with is actually a company called Paper Chain. Paper Chain is a a um, music streaming analytics platform. They work with labels to help labels predict the the um, the royalties that they're getting paid by Apple, by uh, Spot, uh, Spotify, by SoundCloud, you name it. And so, so what they what they want to do is they want to offer these labels a way to finance these assets, to finance their revenue, right? So, if you imagine um, a, a a label has a song that's uh, rushing through the chart, and now suddenly they have millions of streams a day, and they want to take this money and immediately invested in marketing sort of to to be able to keep riding that wave of popularity but they usually have to wait until the end of the month to get the account statement and then three more months until they get paid the revenue so by that time like the song is already passed and the and the next the next artist is uh, is on in the charts right so so they need access to this money real fast and paper chain has data but they don't have the uh, they don't have a, a, a financial product that they can offer to their to their suppliers to their labels and so what what we did what we did with paper chain we helped them tokenize their their assets the labels receivables so we take we take in we take this invoice that says your this label is expected to receive two hundred thousand uh, dollars in revenue in in ninety days from Spotify and maybe maybe we create another NFT another non fungible token that's that for 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 the invoice to Apple, where where we say okay, there's the, they're expected to get a hundred thousand dollars from Apple and maybe five hundred thousand dollars from Google, <clears throat> and so now we we have these these NFTs. These NFTs represent a claim on the future revenue. So I'm the hip hop music label. I have a, I, I receive now a few hundred thousand dollars from these different buyers. These buyers can now. I can now use these NFTs as collateral to borrow money, and so around around the yeah, yeah, and and so those get created as NFTs then, mm-hmm. is that right? Yes. So it starts with the individual asset being created as an NFT. 
why are these NFTs? Because they, by the very nature of them is that they're non-fungible. One invoice is different from another. Uh, one house is different from another. It all depends on what the credit rating is of the individual buyer, like what this particular item is that is being delivered or that is being acquired, right? And so on. So we have these non-fungible tokens and we allow users to mint these tokens that represent this off-chain asset on chain. Now, you ask you ask for the right reason that these that these is, these are NFTs and and sort of if you look at DeFi, you actually one of the things we learned very early on, sort of experimenting with this, like more than a year ago, sort of starting to work with Maker, starting to figure out how we can get trade finance assets and sort of other reward collateral into MCD is that while there's everyone sort of knows CryptoKitties and sort of understands the concept of an NFT, like the DeFi ecosystem is largely built around the RC20 tokens and doesn't really scale to like the single asset. If you look at the governance of Maker, but also of Compound and sort of all of these lending protocols, if you try to plug in an NFT, you, sell, you run into a lot of issues with, with that. And so we had to take our in infrastructure to bring those assets on chain and actually add, add a layer on top um, that allows to bundle these assets and create, create sort of on-chain portfolios that investors can invest in. And 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 this is what we call tin, centrifuge tin lake. So it's a set of smart contracts that allow an asset originator to define a set of criteria under which you want to uh, like add assets to this to this portfolio. These assets are individual NFTs. They get an interest rate. They get um, a, a debt ceiling similar to Maker. So we just we have a you have basically a principal that you can borrow. They get like different um, terms. Um, and so like for each each of these NFT, um, the, the borrowers can borrow money from the asset originators and, and we mint an ERC20 token that represents a share in this in this um, portfolio, in this pool of collateral. Yeah. So you, so, so you can think of, uh, yeah. I mean, of course, the, the uh, completely analogous thing does exist, right, in, in the traditional finance world. Probably the thing that most is maybe best known be something like mortgage-backed securities, right? Where you also have basically, uh, in you know, individual NFT-like assets, which is every single mortgage which has its own risks, and then mm -hmm. you know they all get bundled together, and you start having some sort of tradable asset, right? That can be. So, is, exactly, how yeah. is it similar and how is it different? How Tin Lake works? So I think if you compare the mechanics of. Uh, that fund in the traditional financial world where you have a legal entity that buys um, a whole bunch of loans that has investors that give it capital and sort of that manages the cash flows. I think Tin Lake is sort of the on-chain version of that. So we built so, so we built all of this, we built these smart contracts to manage these pool, this pool of collateral, manage these individual loans and manage the cash flows that that are, are coming from the borrowers. So loan repayments and go to the investors and from investors to the borrowers sort of when, when these loans are originated. And that and so we, we, we move all of these transactions on chain because that's how we can sort of bring transparency and bring, bring, these, bring the liquidity that we want on chain. We want to have as much of this information on chain in, this, in, in a as trustless manner um, as possible. So the NFTs that we have sort of are added to these Tinley contracts, similar process to what a, a, debt, a credit fund today would do. They, they get priced with a pricing oracle. A, a borrowing rate is determined. Um, the advance rate, how much money they can borrow from it is determined. And then a contract that make, make die or some, some sort of stable coin available. Um, so, so in the traditional finance world, and I guess that's that's one place where things sort of you know went horribly wrong in the financial crisis, is that those then get raided, right? And you have like you know Moody's and S and Standard and Poor's, and they would give them you know triple A or something like that, and yeah. uh, and that's then used by buyers, you know, who, who don't really understand maybe what's exactly in those instruments to determine, okay, am I going to buy that? Am I not? Kind of determines. The interest rates. Is there a similar concept here of like kind of uh, ratings <laughs> agencies or something like that? So I think, like, if you look at what happened in two thousand eight, 
one of the uh, biggest issues was that no one had an idea what was actually in these pools. And and like if you look at it, like if like in hindsight, actually, like the analysis shows that the um, exposure, sort of the 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 default, the assets that were in default were actually a, a fraction of what what people were sort of worried about worried about, right? So what happened is you we, they created this like like nested products of like securities that have like all sorts of assets in there like no one knew anymore what was in what and it's sort of just like this intransparent uh, chain of of securitizing securities and sort of securitizing loans and then securitizing securities using these structured finance products and and in the end like this blew up because it it wasn't you could not follow the 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 asset back to the source and i think so so what we build in tinlick is we we're sort of trying to build the opposite we're saying we use on-chain contracts that should prevent all of this because the asset that we bring into into these uh, tin lake pools can be can be audited, can be underwritten. Uh, you can look at them. Of course, if you use that to like, if you start building these pools with intransparent assets that are like you don't know exactly what's in there, you don't know if it's like what it is, then like you will run into the same issues as in two thousand eight. But we're sort of saying no, like you can build this in a better way and we'll, we'll, we have the tools to actually prevent that by, by sort of ensuring that that the the asset is really what it, it claims to be. So we don't, we're not really trying to get these rated and of course we're not trying to um, to recreate what we built in 2008. There's actually a few features that we're building um, in Tinlake that should make this, improve this and make this um, um, much, much more transparent and much more easily um, navigable. And so what I haven't talked so far about is um, the lender side, right? So with Tinlake, um, similar to a fund, you have the borrower, uh, the uh, borrowers that borrow money and you have the investors that invest money, that lend money to these borrowers. And so on the borrower side, a borrower deposits an NFT and gets a stable coin and then starts accruing interest. And to be able to get their collateral back, they have to repay their debt, and then they can unlock their NFT and get it back. On the invest on the on the lender side, we have we mint an ERC twenty token that represents a share in this pool of collateral, um, and so that entitles these ER, these ERC twenty token holders to the revenue, to the interest, and the principal payments that the borrowers make. Um, but we're actually not just doing. Um, creating one ERC-20 token per, um, per tin lake pool, but we create two. So if you're, um, if you're familiar with um, uh, structured finance products, you'll, this, the, the structure is, is called um, a junior and, and senior tranche or sometimes debt and equity tranches in, uh, in the traditional finance world. But so, so what, this is, what this means is that we have uh, two different tokens um, and the two tokens sort of behave very differently. We have the, the junior token, which you call the TIN token. The TIN token is, um, is sort of acts as the first loss capital. So any losses that get that happen in this portfolio um, are covered by the TIN investors first. Then we have what the TIN investor get for that is an, a higher interest, a, 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 a potentially higher yield um, for for sort of taking this riskier um, position, we have the senior tranche, we call which we call the drop token holders. Um, we those are promised a stable interest, and they only take their losses in um, if they if the tin tin token holders are completely wiped out. So to give a one simple example, if we have this hypothetical fund worth um, with a million dollars in assets, um, we. And and two hundred thousand dollars have been provided by tin investors, and eight hundred thousand have been been uh, provided by drop investors. Um, that means if there are losses up to two hundred thousand, um, a hundred percent of these losses would be covered by by tin holders. If the if the losses go over the two hundred, only then do the drop token holders start to suffer losses. Um, and so that 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 means that if you if if in if now this million dollars worth of of assets. If there are one or two bad apples in that portfolio, as a, as a drop token holder, you don't you don't usually suffer the consequences. Only if 
more than 20% of the value of your portfolio disappears in, in unexpectedly. And so that's, that's sort of how we can create um, two tokens that are for two different kind of investors. The junior token investors, the TIN, the TIN investors, this is typically like the asset originator themselves that, that invest in these assets to sort of show that they have some, they have skin in the game, right? So that the asset originator can put up some of their own capital to underwrite these assets, showing that um, they believe in these assets and will cover any losses that happen. And then the, the, um, they, they might add, add some more, um, more, uh, more investors that are more that have more affinity towards the risk towards these asset classes that understand them better and can sort of do this, do the underwriting of this portfolio really well and, and know that they they can invest in the in the junior because they know that this process works and then sort of they have this confidence. For the drop token holders now, it just it it becomes a much safer asset, right? And so they can sort of a, a it can it's sort of this more scalable asset class that a, a maker DAO or or like an just a, a more traditional um, investor that wants to have a low a, a low risk asset class can invest in. Um, and so that's one of the things we do to make um, these asset classes that we're creating in, in DeFi as liquid liquid and as, as safe as possible. Super cool. And and so as an asset, as an underwriter, do you choose kind of like, you know, what proportion is uh, the TIN and the drop token? Yeah, so so um, right, we're 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 sort of creating this generalized framework that will allow these asset originators to bring all sorts of different assets into DeFi to allow to sort of securitize um, these. When when you create an asset class, when you deploy a Tin Lake pool, you can define all of these parameters: what the interest rate is for the drop token, what the ratio is between Tin and drop. Um, and then you can offer that and investors can then invest knowing that sort of these are the risk parameters that they're guaranteed by the, by the contracts. And then, and then the great thing is if you add a bunch of risky tin tokens together, then you can make a drop token out of it. That's like low risk and triple A, no? <laughs> uh, now you're, now you're building very, very risky financial products. And of course you can do that if you want to, but, um, <laughs> I think I hope that people have learned from 2008 not to yeah. necessarily trust them. But yes, you you could. Yeah. Um, no, I mean it's super cool and I think w one thing that's sort of a nice way to think about it too is you know it, the the topic of like supply chain transparency. Like many people are like familiar with this idea of like okay, you have products that maybe go through many different steps on, on the way they're produced and you generally don't know where they came from or what happened with them on the way. You can't really trace it and go back and then blockchain could help with that. And, and this is exactly that in a way, right? It's kind of a, a, a supply chain of, of asset origination finance that you're making transparent. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, very cool. Um, and I know this I know there was some idea or like some work on, for example, getting this into Maker. Like, what's the status with that? Like, that you'd be able to, you know, basically collateralize a CDP with uh, maybe a, this will be drop token, presumably, or? Yeah, so 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 we've been, in, in August 2019, actually, we did the first pilots together with Maker where we financed five different asset classes before MCD actually went live. So what we did is we said, okay, let's assume we want to get these assets into MCD. We're going to mock the entire, simulate the entire part that that is MCD itself, multi-collateral DAI, and we're just going to have a wallet provide the DAI. That, that actually, that month, the, the DAI came from the Maker Foundation. So Maker, the Maker Foundation gave a loan to the asset originators and we sort of went through this entire process with um, creating an NFT for an asset, minting the ERC-20 token that is the security, um, and then funding it and then have, like repaying it and so on. And so, in, so we started doing these first experiments in 2019 and last summer. And actually now we're very close to rolling out our, ma our main net version of, of this and of, of the Tinley contracts that we're not, we're, we're sort of built um, out of the, the feedback, the learnings that we had from these trials last summer. And we'll 
will sort of submit to to inclusion in MCD. And it's still something that we're working very closely with with Maker. So the the example that I mentioned, Paper Chain, um, before that that is one of the uh, users of Tinlink that will be that we're eyeing to have to sort of have in in MCD as 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 soon as the, the governance process is ramping up. Um, actually, la um, in the coming day. It, in the coming days, we're doing a transaction with with Shuttle One to another one with with Maker, where we're um, where a, a gig economy like company in in Asia is going to use um, basically dot like make multi collateral DAI to finance uh, credit card receivables that they have from from their customers to pay their shoppers. Um, this is actually something that we talked about at East that uh, I, I did a presentation at ECC about with uh, Gustav from Maker. And so there's a lot of ongoing work. And I, actually, I think one interesting um, uh, perspective here, and 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 Brian, if you want to um, uh, go down that road, like like I'd be super curious to talk about a bit. Um, is is just sort of what happened on on the ominous uh, Black Thursday, right? Where um where all of DeFi took a big hit and, and the ETH, well, primarily the ETH price took a big hit, but it also had, had all sorts of ripple effects um, in, into the DeFi ecosystem. And I think that's that's like one of the, the places, right, where we're, we're trying to help and where we can um, bring, bring stability to the system. Um, if you look at what happened, like, the stock markets and and the crypto markets were were basically in free fall for 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 quite a few hours there and and while um nasdaq had circuit breakers triggered i i, I might be wrong but i think uh, three times in that in those 24 hours like defi kept running and 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 sort of ran into a whole host of other issues right and the like, keepers couldn't keep up with liquidating collateral and like die so the price of die suddenly shot through the roof because there's not enough liquidity on the markets and i think sort of the the main reason that is the case is because today the only available collateral is is our crypto assets and actually i i need to correct myself here as i think if, like 24 hours ago or so or a little less um uscc was on board as a collateral type on maker so so things are changing there but but really like what happened on thursday was that the only um, the only collateral type they had was BAT and ETH. Both of them like, behave very similarly, right? And, and there is nowhere near the liquidity in the DAI market sort of to be able to, to take that hit. And, and so I think like, like looking at the assets that Centrifuge is bringing, like a, a credit card uh, merchant is going to pay, they're going to pay their invoice un unless, like, unless something really, really bad happens. And I think we're, we have to worry about other things and just keeping Maker afloat, right? But um, and and likewise, like a, a paper chain that's bringing like synthetic receivables from these large corporates, but also like some of the other partners we work with, like SME invoices in the UK is our 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 our, um, our, our assets that we're bringing into into this system. So like so by by adding this collateral type, I think we we do um, we do, we can do a lot to sort of stabilize the system because those assets behave very differently than than crypto and they behave very differently than the stock market as well and so they they sort of having this getting rid of this correlation across the entire system can help add liquidity to die in case in 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 these times it can generate it, it can it's actually probably by now one of the last few assets and that will actually generate yield right um like so small businesses that want to borrow money they're still going to pay interest rate if you try to put your dollars anywhere else, um, like in the stock market, you might get lucky, but it's extremely volatile. Like if you put your ETH into into a maker, you're not going to pay a lot of the stability fee right now. I think is is it half a percent or or zero percent? I, I don't know, but basically nothing, right? So so adding these assets is a potential for makers sort of to grow and get get out of this out of this challenge that they're in right now, where where all the collateral is just too correlated. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it would have helped anything last week, but uh, probably in, not in this instance, I think, no, because there was just no, on the liquidator side, right? I mean, if that, that kind of disappears, then... Well, so so you can you can look at it like that, right? Like you had about 100 or 110 million DAI outstanding, debt outstanding, but all of this was backed by ETH. Mm. Um, and so as ETH was crashing, people were trying to buy up DAI to... to to lower the, the their borrowing rate, but the, the liquidity just wasn't there. If you had a system where 
where where actually the you had a hundred million die from ETH, but another hundred million die from other uncorrelated assets. Those those users would the the hundred million that's coming from that would actually not be contracting, right? So like you have this, you 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 could would have seen the um, die from ETH probably going from a hundred million to sixty million roughly or, or eighty million, whatever it was. But but that hundred million that that was still um, sort of in the system coming from real world assets actually would not have right, and so so those so that hundred million would have would have provided the liquidity that the system needed because there's no pressure in liquidating that that was just going business as usual and so like users that had this liquidity could have made it available and so I think actually it would it would have helped um, yeah maybe helped yeah, yeah yeah I mean in the long run I think it's it's totally clear that. You know, getting real world businesses into this is essential. And also being able to have, uh, you know, for example, assets that are not over collateralized with, you know, with crypto assets. But so I think that's, you know, that's super valuable. Well, let, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about Centrifuge Chain. You guys have been building on Ethereum so far for the most part, but you're now launching your own chain. Uh, what's the thinking behind this? Yeah, so we we started running a little bit contrarian to to what a lot of people in in crypto are doing. Uh, we didn't do an ICO and we didn't take two years to launch our product. Uh, we actually always like started running very small experiments. I mentioned like a year ago we did the first transactions on mainnet. Uh, we're now launching um, Tin Lake on Ethereum, but I, and and sort of along those lines, like we're we're sort of trying experimenting. We want to we want to like see see our, our stuff work, see our stuff used, and and iterate on that. And so sort of the the natural evolution from sort of all all of that we're doing is actually that on the NFT side we need a lot more scalability. We need to be able to add uh, tons of metadata that can be um, verified, that can be looked at. Right. So like if you think of an invoice, you might want to have address information. You want to have tax information. You want to have um, the, the details you need to be able to price an asset like this, and that, and and Ethereum is is just not g- giving us the scalability we need for that. Like if you look at a Fortune Fortune 500 company, they send about twenty five thousand invoices a day, and and so just to to give you an idea of the scale, right? Like that is that is pretty much the the throughput of Ethereum today. And so we we started looking for alternatives just. From a scalability and a and then long term also the privacy um, ish, privacy solution right we're so we decided to start building on substrate we're launching our own proof of stake chain that is used to originate these assets so so the what we talked about with Tin Lake is a set of smart contracts that for now will stay on Ethereum but the NFTs that you use to as collateral for these individual loans that will actually be, they, those will be originated from our own chain. And so for that, we're launching, we're launching a substrate with uh, just a sort of fairly similar model to what, what we have on Ethereum today. And over the cu- next couple of months, we're actually rolling out a solution that will allow us to mint those NFTs, not just on substrate, much, much faster and much cheaper, but also with with uh, privacy preserving uh, technologies and sort of the the, t- the tech buzzwords that I can mention here is what we're going what we're doing is we're we're um, allowing users to mint their NFTs by so providing a zero knowledge proof around a lot of the information that they have um, so only disclosing what is absolutely necessary so if you have a credit rating but you don't want to say who you are you can show that you have this credit rating but that you're not um, that that it's not, that, but not who you are. You could have a a proof that a proof of solvency without having to say what your bank account balance is and, and things like that, right? And so those 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 things are what we're <clears throat> sort of working towards. Cool. Yeah. No, we're super excited uh, for this to go live and for kind of the first things to happen on that. What's what's the roadmap for the next, you know, maybe twelve to twenty four months? That's a that's a that's infinity in in crypto. I, I always say I, but but I'll I'll try to I'll try to make an attempt. I think um, if we 
if you look at DeFi today, it's very much, and and I'm I'm looking coming at this from the Ethereum community, right? Uh, which I think Centrifuge is is very much a part of. Um, DeFi mostly happens on Ethereum. It's like all within one chain, and and I think the ecosystem is going to grow beyond just what Ethereum is, and and if that's a an opportunity for Ethereum, and 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 not not just a, a threat as some as some people might might see it. Um, and and so if I look at this um, from our perspective, our goal is to create these ERC twenty tokens that uh, represent these in uh, shares in these different asset classes and plug those into as many different chains, as many different DeFi protocols that we can find. Those this will be in the substrate in the Polkadot ecosystem. This will be on Ethereum. It could be on Ethereum two point uh, it can be in Cosmos, right? Um, and so that our interest is to build um, these liquid asset classes for these asset originators and allow them to get capital wherever it is cheapest or wherever it, it works best for them. <clears throat> and so so for, for Centrifuge, um, our our roadmap, our, our plan is sort of to develop Tin Lake. I, at some point, um, we probably will be offering like the contracts, not just on Ethereum, but also on our own chain. Um, and sort of integrate with with these many different chains um, as a place to sell to sort of sell these assets to have investors buy these assets. Okay, cool, cool. And now, if we are going even further down the line, let's say ten years from now, what's how is the world going to be different if you guys you know succeed beyond you you know your wildest dreams? So, I think. What we're doing right right now, what we're doing right now is sort of we're, we're helping bring these legacy like processes on chain. We still have this legal document that is an invoice that needs to exist off chain, and we sort of create an NFT that that has legal recourse and and the meaning and the value, but but it's still very much tied to the off chain paper contract. I think like if we if we succeed beyond our wildest dream, and I and I'm. Uh, maybe an optimist or a dreamer that I, I do believe that that's where, where the world is going. Um, actually, the 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 line between off-chain like legal documents and smart contract will be gradually become blurrier and blurrier, and meaning that at some point there is no difference anymore. And of course, like sort of what happens on-chain is is sort of the universally accepted truth, and is what what legally is is the is is, is the, the state, right? What legally is, is going to matter. Um, and we can, and, and I think going um, from what we're doing now by tokenizing these existing assets and, and making them liquid, we're sort of creating a pulling force that pulls these assets into crypto, it pulls users into crypto, allowing them to use it. The more they use it, the more they depend on it, the more they, they will accept blockchains as the source of truth, like open protocols, decentralized networks as a source of truth. Um, and and use those more and sort of move more of that process on chain and that will um, make make ethereum and and DeFi and and sort of all of that I think succeed beyond beyond uh, what we can imagine it to look like today cool well thanks so much for for joining us today Lucas we're of course going to link to lots of resources so if people want to learn more about centrifuge you know they know where to go and I'm sure this is not the last time we talk about Centrifuge, especially once the yeah. chain launches. And yeah, we're excited, excited for the launch. And yeah, great. Thanks so much for joining us. That's good. Nice talking to you, Ryan. Thank you for listening to the Chorus One podcast. Visit chorus.one for more information about our work. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to stay tuned on new episodes airing every Monday.